Hello and welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Stephen Andrews, and today I'm excited. I've wanted to do this video for months and months and months, haven't got around to it. it probably because it entails getting a lot of books together and as you see in the sort of title it's meant to be a top 10 or 15 but the generosity of my spirit and the embarrassment of riches with which I'm surrounded in terms of all the books I have here instead of this being a countdown a chart or a ranked list this is something different this is just to encourage you to look at the wonderful world of associational reading re-SF What is associational SF? Well, of course, it isn't actually SF at all. What we're talking about is books which are written by science fiction writers, writers who are predominantly science fiction writers, but they're not SF books. And a while ago, I did a video on the channel about the mainstream novels of Philip K. Dick. And if you only read science fiction, don't switch off now, because if you like a writer, if you like what they write, if you like their pro style, their ideas, very often when they turn to the odd mainstream novel, they produce stunning books, which are not like anything else. So today I've just pulled off a couple of piles of things and I probably have a lot more, so it's going to be more than 10. But as I say, it's generosity of spirit and I just really want to talk to you about why you should read non-SF books by SF writers. So on we go. So for Philip K. Dick, there is a specialised video you can look at and he wrote lots of mainstream novels, only one of which was published in his lifetime. Some of them are excellent and everybody I know who is a serious dickhead enjoys them. So do watch that video. I'll put a link in at the end of this one. But I just want to talk about some other wonderful books by amazing writers who you will know and love. And you may never have come across these books. You know, these are things which, you know, are well worth seeking out. I'm not saying they're all in print, but a lot of them are gettable. So we can go from there. Another one of my favourites, so let's call this number 10 for sake of argument, even though as I say it's probably 15 or more, is Harlan Ellison. Now this is Children of the Streets, Seven House, published in hardcover. Most of these went to libraries. This was about 20 years ago, maybe a bit longer, and I snapped that up. And Ellison wrote all sorts of things. He would say himself that he wasn't an SF writer, that he was mostly a fantasy writer, but he was just a writer per se. But something that Alison did early in his career was write lots of juvenile delinquent stories about things which were going on in the streets of the major cities in America and they were mostly published in magazines, sometimes in men's magazines. You could say they were exploitive but they always had a moral heart and he wrote quite a lot of them and if you watch my video which I go through my Harlan Ellison paper you'll see a few of them. This is an uncommon one, very beautiful book. If you see it in any condition snap it up and Ellison ran with a street gang in Brooklyn called the Barons and he wrote about that in in his book um, Memoirs from Purgatory and there's a fictionalized version called Web of the City aka Rumble was the original title but he wrote all sorts of things this is an early novel by Allison he never wrote many novels this is probably I would say this is actually his longest actual novel and this is Spidercast aka Rockabilly and this is about an Elvis Presley type character and how he's exploited and the problems he has in the early days of rock and roll and rock and roll novels are a bit of a thing with SF writers there's a kind of associational feel between the rebellious spirit of rock and roll and the outsider iconoclasticism of SF. Iconoclasticism, is that a word? Iconoclasm, that's what it should be. So Alison, watch out for those. Anything of his which isn't SF or fantasy, pick it up because he's always a great read. You know, he really burns. The emotions are there, the eye are there with the injustice of society. It's always there in Harlan, so watch out for it. And this one is a jewel in the crown. Now, somebody who is discussed an awful lot on YouTube, and it's always great to hear his name come up, is Alfred Bester. Alfred Bester really is the man who began modern SF in terms of style, though I would argue to a certain degree for Henry Cutner and C.L. Moore before him, but Bester is where things really leap forward. Now, people are always talking about Tiger Tiger, or The Star's My Destination, as it's known these days, The Demolished Man. Fewer people talk about the short stories, and they to me are the best things, and the later SF novels get kind of passed over. 
But actually, two out of three of those later SF novels are OK. And I'll talk about those on the channel again, because I've read them all a long time ago. I need to do some rereading to talk about those a bit more. But what nobody talks about with Bester is the fact that he wrote other books as well. Now, in between The Demolished Man and Tiger Tiger, The Stars My Destination, he wrote this, The Rat Race, also known as Who He. This is a Panther edition, I believe, from about 1960. So this is written in the early 50s. And it's a Hitchcockian thriller about the early days of TV. And it's set, it's set around a sort of quiz type general entertainment show. And one night when the show is about to go out, what the audience can't see, but what all the cast and the people in the show, in the game show can see, is that there is somebody hanging from a lighting rig by the neck. And so it's a murder mystery and it's fast moving. It's set in the Mad Men era, 1950s. So it's very sharp and wisecracking. And you get a lot of the same sort of style that Bester used in his SF. And it's very much a book of his time, but it's a fantastic book. And it's more of the kind of, I would say it's more Cary Grant, than Jimmy Stewart, shall we say, and it's quite uncommon in any format. There was a print on demand one with the title Who He a while ago, and I got this a while ago because I had a really old Hamlin one, which is a complete mess. And if you're a best right, you really must read this, it's really good. Now, somewhere else here, I have another bester, and this is one which, let's see, when did I get this? Um, let's have a look. This came out in the early 90s, 1991 from Tafford, and this is Tender Loving Rage. Now, I don't think Tender Loving Rage has ever been published in paperback. I may be wrong. If you have one or you've seen another edition, let me know. This was the first edition, first printing. And obviously by this point, Bester was dead. He died in 87. He was due to be guest of honour, the top guest of honour at the 87 World Con, which I went to in Brighton. And he couldn't turn up for reasons of ill health. And of course he divorced his wife, I believe. And he left all his money to his barman. What a character. And again, this is a very Hitchcockian book. Very beautiful, as you see. Tender Loving Rage. And it's got a marvellous climax, which I seem to remember happens on a beach or a seafront. And when I first read Thomas Harris's Manhunter, not Manhunter, Red Dragon, which was filmed as Manhunter, it did remind me of this. But as I say, it's more sort of Cary Grant than Jimmy Stewart in the Hitchcock way. And this is about a Madison Avenue guy and a famous scientist who are drawn to this woman who is running from a past which could actually destroy them all. And great stuff. And this was never published in Bester's lifetime. And I'm not quite sure why. I can't recall why. But if you ever see either of these, pick them up. So altogether, Bester wrote these two mainstream thrillers, five science fiction novels. So that's seven novels and most people have only read two. So do try and get them. Um, as I say, they're very, very 50s, but they're absolutely fantastic and they crackle along and the dialogue is really sharp and witty. Everything that you get in terms of the electrical feeling of the famous SF novels is in these. So that's Tender Loving Rage and The Rat Race. Great stuff. What else do we have? Well, let's have a look at a couple of paperbacks. I thought I'd originally do this with all paperbacks. Then I've got a pile um, somewhere over there, which is like associational paperbacks. And associational, if you look up in the in Science Fiction Encyclopedia, an author entry, and it'll name books and it'll say associational. And it means that they're usually mainstream novels or mainstream collections. So it's quite an interesting thing to look into. And this is a book which is very dear to my heart. Sadly, it's very, very uncommon. I wish somebody would reprint it. It was free to read on his website when he was alive and he died a few years ago. And this is The Tale of Willie's Rats by Mick Farron. Look at that cover. And this is Mayflower, Mayflower Panther, later from Granada Grafton from the mid 70s. And this is now, sadly, as I say, a very uncommon book. It'll cost you about 50 pounds. I bought this, I bought this in the 80s and it was probably like a quid or something. I might still have the price. £1.20 and that was a lot of money for a, an old paper about then. So I'm just going to pop it on there. And The Tale of Willie's Rats. And Mick Farron, if you know Mick Farron, he was a rock and roll writer. He was a rock and roll star in a minor way. He was in a band called The Social Deviants, 
who then became the Deviants, and were linked to the Pink Fairies, who were an acid rock band from the UK who had affiliations with Hawkwind and Michael Moorcock. They came from the Ladbroke Grove area, where Moorcock lived in the 60s and 70s. So it's a very rock and roll thing. And Farron wrote a lot of SF novels. Um, probably the most famous one is The Song of Fade the Gambler. There's the DNA Cowboys Tetralogy, which have wonderful titles like The Synaptic Manhunt to The Neural Atrocity. The Texts of Festival is another early book by him. And he wrote cyberpunk books. And he's a great guy, you know, I wish I'd met him. Real attitude. He wrote a book about the black leather jacket and his impact on society. He was a cool guy. But this is the tale of Willie's Rats. And this is, quite frankly, one of my favourite novels, even though it's an exploitation novel. It's a first-person narrative of a guy who when he's a young boy it's the 1950s he's a schoolboy, and he is at home in his bedroom supposed to be doing his homework he's only about 10 year old if that and he hears elvis on the radio and the world changes and we follow him and his name is let's have a think lou lou francis and he goes out into the world he drops out he becomes a bit of a rebel and you see his odyssey through the evolution of popular music gets into the Beatles the folk scene and gradually he works with different bands plays different styles blues jazz what have you and then he becomes a bassist in a rock and roll band and then he has since been a singer in a band called Willie's Rats who are like a combination of the Vuvd Underground the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin. And the beauty of this book is that it feels completely authentic. Most rock and roll novels are terrible. If you've ever read Espadier Street by Ian Banks, I mean, that's not bad because Farron, as I say, was a rock star. He was a great lyricist. He wrote amazing songs. Uh, he wasn't essentially a great singer, I don't think, myself. And there's a solo album, which I would probably best avoid. But songs like Broken Statue, which he wrote for the Pink Fairies, is just astonishingly good. And you see Lou Francis going through this odyssey and you see the evolution of the rock scene, how powerful they become. And it sort of climaxes in the late 60s, early 70s, and there's all sorts of mirrorings and homages to all sorts of things from the real world of rock and roll. And it's a brilliant, brilliant novel. It's a popular novel, but it's a brilliant one, and I can't say enough good about it. I wish somebody would reissue it, because it's absolutely fantastic. If you ever see it, pick it up. It is worth the 50 quid. Fantastic rock and roll novel. The best rock and roll novel ever written and anybody who likes cyberpunk new wave you really dig this it really is the business so speaking of new wave and outsiders and totally crazy people we then move on to the very wonderful samuel r delaney and um, this is the madman which i have shown on the channel before i think i flashed this up on the screen or maybe waved it around in the video i did about the time that they banned samuel r delaney's book and we're not talking about hog we're talking about the tides of lust when that was banned in the uk and if you haven't watched that video do check it out this is the madman and as you see, it's an A-format paperback, big, chunky book, published by Rhinoceros, you know. Rhinoceros and an imprint that were around about 20 years ago, and they did adult fiction. They did some of Farmer's more erotic books. And The Madman is one of the most extreme, and, you know, it's a big thing on YouTube to say a book is disturbing. And, you know, I've got a high, you know, disturbance quotient. I can have on most things, you know, it's one of those things. I kind of girded my loins when I was younger and thought I'm going to read all the, the banned books. And funnily enough, I had an exchange with Michael at Fit To Be Read the other day. He did a thing about banned SF novels. And of course, in the States, things are getting banned from schools and libraries and what have you all the time. And I was saying, well, in the UK, that doesn't happen. You know, we had famous cases, court cases, and the last really big ones are mostly in the 1960s, when things were prosecuted, publishers were prosecuted under the Obscene Publications Act. And that was the last time things got banned. And it all got sort of blown away. Really. Censorship of literature was pretty much blown away in Britain back in the 60s. It ended, you know, so the Lady Chatley trial with Penguin and D.H. Lawrence, that was the most important one. But anyway, The Madman really is quite an extreme book. It's the narrative of a New York-based academic who's gay, and he's doing research into philosopher, and they sort of flashes of Wittgenstein and Foucault, and really it reminded me a lot of, of Michel Foucault's work. If you don't know who Foucault was, Foucault was a French thinker who really sort of came up with this idea of episteme's which is that power is about knowledge 
and we can only have power about what we know. So the authorities and people in power and power structures really just push us down by only letting us know certain things. And he talked a lot about the body and how the body was punished. There's an amazing book called Discipline and Punish, which is about the birth of the prison. And Foucault was quite a controversial figure and he was gay himself and he died of AIDS, I believe. Um, somebody correct me if that's wrong. And I read an amazing biography of him by a guy called James Miller, which was really good, called The Passion of Michel Foucault. And he was one of the French deconstructionists. They decided to take apart the grand narrative of forward movement of Western philosophy, of the evolution of human society, just to say, really, it needs to be taken apart and questioned. There are other narratives. And this led into identity politics. So a lot of things now you hear when you hear the word narrative, a lot of it is down to Foucault and another guy called Jacques Derrida. But going back to the book, the academic is researching this philosopher and develop his own philosophy, but he spends a lot of time in the company of homeless men um, who prostitute themselves. And there are some very, very extreme sexual acts in this, which I'm not going to go into because it's not for the faint of heart. Um, um, but it is an amazing novel. It's a clever novel. And all this is happening during the age of HIV and AIDS. And this is the madman. He's going out there and he's spending time outside with these homeless men. And it really sort of is quite something. A lot of people say it is utterly disgusting and in lots of ways it is, but it's a book really that is designed to make you think about language, to make you think about power and the body and, you know, what do we really know? And it's got a fascinating appendix in there as well. Um, so if you ever see The Madman, it's very, very uncommon in the Richard Knack hardcover. I think my friend Graham's got one and it's an uncommon book anyway. I'm not sure if it's in print. I don't think it is at the moment. People talk about Hogg and Hogg's an obviously an extreme book but this is the one that people don't know about really really fascinating stuff and the writing of course is magnificent because Delaney if anybody could write about the city and the passion and the heat of the outsider Delaney's the only person for me who rivals Jean Chenet a bold claim but there we go to know who Chenet is look him up maybe we'll talk about him on the channel one day so that's Delaney somebody else from the 60s and 70s at a career after that is associated with those areas. Well, I've talked about a lot recently is one of my idols is Keith Roberts and Keith Roberts could have written anything. This is his um, one mainstream novel or is it? There's another one, another one later on, which is more of a crime novel. This is an historical novel. This is The Boat of Fate, which is published by Hutchinson. And this hardcover is actually relatively common. If you can find the A format Hodder and Stone paperback, good for you, because that's like hen's teeth. I think I've only ever seen one or two copies, but I keep coming across this second hand. The jacket's always a bit frayed and what have you, and I've had this for a long time. And um, this is a Roman Empire novel is set during the Roman Roman reign over Europe. And it's very, very good. It's quite melancholic. Uh, first published in 1971. And really, it is about a character who is a Roman, but he's sort of part Celtic. There's a lot of it happens in Spain and it's the sort of declining sort of era of the Roman Empire. And it's about his thwarted ambition. And there is a kind of reflection of that in the way that the empire is going just before the barbarians are coming in. If you like really, really good, well-written historical fiction, you can't go wrong with this. And I did a couple of events going back six, or seven years ago with several writers who write Roman historical fiction. Um, ben Kane, various other people. I did about four of them and I did come with Ben and Ben sticks in my mind because he lives locally. A really nice guy. He used to be a vet, but he's been a full time writer for a long time now. And we did this event and these guys who do this Roman Empire fiction, they really, really know their stuff. They do the research and they dare not get it wrong because there's a lot of devotees of Roman Empire fiction out there and you're not allowed to get it wrong. I recommended this book to Ben and he loved it and he has said both online and to me personally, that he thinks it's one of the finest Roman Empire novels ever written. And at some point we're going to do something about Roman Empire novels because my friend Graham, the grumpy old man, and another friend of mine are big devotees of this area. And I've read one or two things, but they really know their stuff. So that'll be a guest slot. We must get around to that at some point. And I know a lot of you will be interested in that. I know Matt Defoe out there at Science Fiction Reads Loves Historical. And this is great stuff. And Ben Kane is to say, historical novelist. He said he thought this was fantastic. Interestingly, I also recommended to him 
Blood Games by Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough, which is a Saint Germain vampire novel set in the Roman milieu and it's very very good and she wrote several of those and Ben said that was excellent as well but he got annoyed by Yarbrough going on about the fact that Saint Germain the central character has small hands and that she mentions it all the time and it is part of her trying to distance her character from the usual thing of the vampire being this huge tall guy with big hands you know broad shoulders what have you because Saint Germain's a bit different I will talk about him again but yeah this is really really good so if you've enjoyed things like Pavan the Chalk Giants, which is admittedly a difficult book. This is right up your street. And it's not too uncommon. In the States, I'm not certain. There has been a print-on-demand edition from Cosmos Wildside in recent years. So The Boat of Fate. Amazing historical novel. If you like Robert Graves, you'd love this. So while we're on the subject of more sort of classic sort of things, really, this is a book which is very dear to my heart. And this is Wyvern by A. Atanasio. You notice how the whole concept of numbering and ranking has gone out the window because, I mean, who cares? You know, books are different from each other. You know, what you like one day or at one point in your life is going to be different another time. Just take my word for it. These are all books worth examining if you like SF. Now, of course, A.A. Atanasio wrote lots of SF and fantasy. He's still active. He's still alive. What a fantastic name, A.A. Atanasio. And I will never forget in the early 80s reading his first novel, Radex, which is the amazing psychedelic SF novel with sort of lots of grit in it and lots of colour and I just I just can't there's nobody like Atanasio he's impossible to describe he's very vivid and in your face he's very ornate he can be a difficult read and Radix is an incredible book and there were three sequels he's written lots of fantasy novels and if you like really fine textured prose with sort of lots of ripples of silk running through it and explosions of fireworks and firecrackers going off in your head you know Atanasio is the man this is Wyvern now of course a Wyvern is a dragon this came out um at the late 80s this is Grafton very beautiful as you see and this was a simultaneous hardcover and trade paperback. I think they probably printed about a thousand in hardcover, went to libraries. I sold loads of the trade paperback, did quite well. And it is a mainstream novel. And it was sort of marketed at the time. It said it falls somewhere between the sea stories of Robert Louis Stevenson, you know, Treasure Island, that sort of thing. And the spiritual writings of Carlos Castaneda. Now, Castaneda was a Latin American anthropologist who wrote a series of books about a Yaki Indian Bruco or shaman called Don Juan. And he supposedly went down to Mexico, met this shaman, was in his tutelage. They took all sorts of mind altering substances together and the books gradually get more and more absurd. And, you know, they were exposed as fakes. And I've read two books which say, you know, this is all made up, but nonetheless, his philosophy and his spiritual thinking are really interesting. So they, and Castaneda was popular. I, he was popular in the 60s, 70s, right the way through the 80s, but he kind of faded away. And I first read him in the 80s and I read his first six books in about eight days and they blew my mind. They're absolutely amazing. And they're worth reading if you like intelligent fantasy novels, because even though they're presented as nonfiction, they're, they're really, really quite something. You know? <laughs> and they have a real sort of feel all of their own. I must revisit them again someday. But this was placed in that thing. And this is a story of piracy. And it's about a boy who grows up. And I think he's half native, half white. Let's see. Um, Jackie Geff John, 1609, son of a beautiful native girl in Borneo and a Dutch trader. So he becomes an outcast and he goes on this wonderful odyssey across Asia and the South Pacific. And this is a story of love and revenge. And he takes the wyvern, the dragon, the symbol of life as his sigil. And it's really quite something. And if you've ever read the Australian classic, His Natural Life by Marcus Clarke, which is sometimes entitled for the term of his natural life, which is a rip roaring piracy and betrayal story. It really is quite something. And if you, you fancy a real epic, never mind Johnny Depp, Pirates of the Caribbean. In fact, never mind Tim Powers is on Stranger Tides, which is great and appeared at the same time as this. Wyvern is the one. 
all sorts of flashes of psychedelic color and it does go into that sort of druggy territory as well but it's a wonderful wonderful book and you have hints of apocalypse now and heart of the darkness lucius shepherd if lucius shepherd was going to write the mainstream bestseller he would have written wyvern but it never caught on so it's a real cult book but try and pick it up and if you haven't read radix radix is one of the most mind-blowing books you'll ever read i can only sort of really how can i describe radix it's a real issue there's a story by atanasio called the star pools which is a cthulhu mythos story and in that it begins with a character standing in a pond and he cuts his foot on a rock which is you know underneath his foot in the pond and he starts to bleed and it's the sort of pain and the saltiness and it's just amazing and you think gosh you can really feel it and that's the sort of writer that Atanasio is. Now just in case you thought that this entire video is going to be all about these flaky countercultural books and that science fiction writers don't really write pure mainstream social novels of character well you'd be wrong and Brian Aldiss is a cardinal example of the very finest sort of social fiction this is forgotten life i mean brian had a best-selling trilogy with the horatio stubbs books in the 70s which were about a soldier's coming of age and sexual awakening and um, they were quite big bestsellers in the early 70s and they did really really well and of course brian himself was in the army he was in burma and they did really well and this was a kind of return to mainstream for him he did a book called life in the west in the early 80s which um, Anthony Burgess said was fantastic and it's in Burgess's book 99 novels also in that is Keith Roberts's Pavan and it's Burgess's critique of Pavan saying how good it was which really pushed Roberts back into the forefront of things in the 80s and that's how he got his deal with Penguin at least that's what people think anyway and, and he was con Keith was convinced of that but we're back to all this all this produced this and uh, Forgotten Life comes from the late 80s early 90s let's just have a look and 88 and it's published by Golanx because Golanx then was still a mainstream publisher they didn't publish only SF and fantasy they did all sorts of things they were still independent and this is about an Oxford Don whose wife writes fantasy novels and the Don's brother has just sort of died and he's going through some letters and notebooks and going back in the past and it covers an enormous sweep of time it covers about 50 years and there's all sorts of family stuff there's secrets what have you so if you want a really really good really well written social novel and there are a couple of quasi sequels as well Forgotten Life is fantastic and it really does bring across to you the craft of the novelist as a creative character and how character and incident combine to form plot so this is textbook stuff and little red these days and all this what a fine man he was fantastic guy which brings me on to possibly the most important mainstream novel by an SF writer that you can maybe ever read or certainly in terms of understanding English literary SF and the new wave and one of the most influential figures of our time still even though he's been dead for some years and that's JG Ballard and this is Empire of the Sun and I'm just going to pop that on the podium there sorry Brian but you have to make way for JG um, most of these which I'm showing you the hardcovers of first editions this isn't this is a reprint um, it's about the eighth reprint I should try and pick up a first one day but because this was Ballard's biggest book and his first pure mainstream novel though arguably you could say that about Concrete Island or High Rise or maybe even Crash because Ballard himself that he's said that he wasn't writing science fiction anymore but this is the one when this came out in 1984 I just entered the book trade it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize I really wanted it to win and it is effectively an autobiographical novel it's not an autobiography there are differences in this between the central character and Ballard and of course Ballard was born in Shanghai in about 1930 his parents were out there and his father was a sort of corporate type so he grew up in China and what happened to Ballard was when the Japanese invaded um, they were captured by the Japanese and interned in a prisoner of war camp and Ballard spent I think it was about two and a half years in a prisoner of war camp maybe longer and um, this is the novelized account of a young boy called Jim who gets separated from his parents in reality um, JG Ballard was with his parents and he falls in with various characters and really what's fascinating about this was that 
all the symbolism which we've seen time and time again in Ballard's writing from the 50s onwards of the drain swimming pools and the various symbols come up in this and there is the film version by Steven Spielberg but it's way way too sentimental this is a good deal more acerbic and distance and it's fascinating seeing how a child in the middle of an occupied zone sees the war as a, a wonderful adventure so when Ballard came to the UK in the first time in 45 46 he was an adolescent he was a British adolescent who'd never been in Britain so he immediately found Britain very strange and that's how we ended up with this distance way of looking at the contemporary world and a different way of thinking about the future and to understand that and the symbolism of it Empire of the Sun is when it's a great novel anyway fantastic and you get all these wonderful sequences the early sequence when Jim is separated from his parents and he's in Shanghai on his own exploring on his bike and that marvelous marvelous stuff and it didn't win the Booker Prize something far more conventional one um, and we won't go into that but this is very very much the one um, Empire of the Sun and I love that title and um, this was like a dividing line some people say that Ballard was never the same after this and I would say his next novel The Day of Creation which is also a mainstream novel but it has certain affinities with the catastrophe novels early in his career because it's about a river which suddenly erupts out of nowhere in Africa it sort of breaks out as a spring and a guy who follows it he goes on this Hegira following this river it's very interesting psychologically but it's, it's not as powerful as the earlier work and I think Christopher Priest is somebody who feels that he was never the same after that and I think there's a certain amount of truth in that but he was a dividing line and he had stepped away from SF and he could write all sorts of things and you could argue that everything he wrote after that was a mainstream novel but it's Ballard and Ballard thought differently he had different prose and as David Pringle his archivist and wonderful critic said you know that Ballard had a painter's eye rather than a poet's tongue and that's the way to approach this the painter's eye you really see it and feel it and it's different and defies expectations like good novels should so Empire of the Sun is, is very much one to go for now another one of my favorite writers who I have interviewed on the channel as you know is M John Harrison and um, this is one of my favorite novels per se I pop this in my book 100 must read books for men I do think it's for everybody but it is something I think that men particularly relate to because it's about obsession and this is climbers and this is the first edition and this will be signed that ballad signed as well there you go and I did an event with Mike to promote this back in when it came out which had been 89 in Bath and that was the second time I met him and Mike was doing a lot of climbing then he used to climbing and fell running and you know Mike's a sort of small wiry guy very fit looking um, he's had a heart attack in recent years but he's come through it and he still looks great but then he was a real powerhouse you know even though he was only a small guy and I still love um, seeing him read I mean I've never seen and heard anybody read their work so well and funny enough the night that he was promoting this he read a short story called Egnaro which he explained was orange spelt backwards and that's a wonderful story which is in a collection called the ice monkey one of my two or three favorite stories by him but climbers is about somebody called Mike who bonds with three or four other men and they meet up at the weekend to go rock climbing and they're all from different backgrounds and it doesn't really have much of a plot these guys meet up there's different things going on in their lives they intersect in different ways but it's about obsession so no matter what your obsession is whatever your hobby is whatever you bond about and this is quite a male thing men tend to bond over stuff and practices rather than sort of more subtle social networks which women have and I'm not saying it's always that way but that is a bit of a thing and this goes through that absolutely beautifully and the prose is direct but it's got all his usual style and color and edginess so if you found that you've struggled to read M John this is a great entry point because that shows you what he does when he's not dealing with the strangeness of fantasies where the landscape falls apart or these mind-bending space operas that he did round about 2000 to 2010 climbers it's unadorned it's pure and it's actually my favorite novel by him I wish he'd written more mainstream novels they're short stories but this is really something and I would say that the best book I've read this year is his autobiography can book about writing which is called wish I was sure and you can hear all about that 
on the interview I did with him some months ago. Fantastic stuff. So Climbers, it's in print. It's pretty much always in print. Amazing book. It won the Boardman Tasker Award for Mountaineering Literature, which is awarded every year. And it's the only novel to ever win the Boardman Tasker Award. Now, you won't get me climbing even up a ladder. You know, I'm too much of a wuss. But climbing literature has a long and very distinguished sort of history, really. In, um, in sort of book in book publishing and another great climbing novel I read was by James Salter and that's called Solo Faces and that's great as well but it's not as good as this this really is the business then we move across the the ocean to the good old US of A and the very wonderful Joe Haldeman this is 1968, also known as War Year. I think the original title was War Year. Now, of course, you and I know Haldeman as the author of The Forever War, that magnificent space opera, military war, anti-war novel about misunderstanding, time dilation, lots of physics, lots of zaps and stuff. I always say The Forever War is the book I would recommend to people who've never read an SF novel, but they like science fiction films, if they like the sort of things like Aliens, Starship Troopers. I mean, The Forever War is the one. Now, Haldeman, of course, was a physicist. Um, he still is, because he's, he's still with us, and a writer as well. And he was also a soldier. He fought in Vietnam. He was wounded and got the Purple Heart, which is what you get when you're wounded. And um, this is his account of it. And, you know, it's a shame it's never been filmed, this great stuff, and the New York Times review said it was sort of hard and realistic and it really is super so you know if you enjoy things like Platoon, Born on the 4th of July, all those great Vietnam, so there's Hamburger Hill, all those things. This is about a guy called Spider who leaves his girlfriend at home as so many men, men did and goes off with dreams of glory but it isn't all that great. So this is a fantastic one and it is an uncommon book in the UK. I don't think it's been printed for a long time and sadly some of the most interesting Vietnam books are hard to get. Certain things stay in print. The one which stays in print, the non-fiction one, which probably is the best-selling non-fiction one, is Dispatches by Michael Hare. But I never really got on with that. I didn't do it for me and this Chicken Hawk by Robert Mason and loads of others. But really, this is a fantastic one. The best book I've read about the Vietnam War is a book called The Things They Carried by a writer called Tim O'Brien, which is just so moving. It's probably the best novel I've read this century and I am going to do a video about that. I'll talk about that again. But this is something to watch out for. So if you enjoy The Forever War, you'd really enjoy this because, you know, you see where the stuff of The Forever War comes from, where Lieutenant Mandela's chops come from. The realism of the horror of war, which is in The Forever War, is sure in 1968. So it's a great one to watch out for. It's a shame it hasn't been reissued in a sort of back-to-back, -back, a dos a dos chat book, or the two in an omnibus, because it would be too big for, for a um, dos a dos chat book. That would be really something, but great stuff. So watch out for it. I got this not too long ago for only a few quid. I snapped it up as soon as I saw it. Uncommon, but great stuff. But moving on to the 60s again, we had Vietnam and but there's other forms of radicalism as well. And one of the great radicals of the 1960s was, of course, the very wonderful Norman Spinrad. And this is The Children of Hamelin. And this is published by Tafford. And um, Tafford also published the best art cover I showed you earlier on. And I always think I got this at the Worldcon, but I didn't. This is a few years later. And I think this is from the early 90s as well. This is 91 as well. And this is one of Norman's typically angry books with lots of explosions about a guy who exposes a cult. A friend falls in with a cult and Timothy Leary liked it. And it's about the dangers of people falling in with cults. And in some ways it reminds me of a book which goes into that territory called Dark Seeker by K.W. Jeter, but that has a supernatural or SF aspect. This is a pure mainstream novel. And you also get flashes of the sort of feeling that you get from Bug Jack Barron, that Aya, that Crusader thing that Spinrad's so good at. And as you can see, it's very, very beautiful. So it's classic, typical Spinrad, polemical, impassioned, caring, but yet full of blazing Aya, just what you want from Norman. Great, great stuff. Another thing which is important for writers 
is to travel if you can because you know people say that travel broadens the mind i mean my feeling is to travel awakens the senses you can broaden your mind by reading and something i do before i travel anyway is try and read a lot about it and i can always get more out of it so i'm getting it actually out of the books but that enhances the experience but the sensory side of travel you cannot get except by going there you can look at videos and things and that's great and i hope you watch some of my capri and paris videos but really you sort of have to do it yourself you can only open the door a bit so people can see through the chink to get the blazing glory of the light of the place itself or the darkness of the place itself you have to go there and somebody who went there and has been there and i'm hoping to interview him on the channel soon we just need to get around to it is the very very wonderful gary kilworth now gary kilworth i've talked about quite a bit this year a figure who would be regarded by many as a fairly minor sf writer he came to writing sf in the mid 70s and he won the golang's sunday times sf short story prize with a story called let's go to golgotha which is a very interesting take on time travel and the crucifixion if you can ever get to read it do let's go to golgotha really great stuff and Gary has written about 80 books and he's in his 80s and I think he's 83. Very, very nice guy. I met him once in 89 and we did an event together, the same event with M. John Harrison. So it was me, Gary and M. John and we had a fantastic time. And he was doing anthropomorphic fantasy novels then. He'd just written his first one and that's about foxes. And he's written military history, he's written travel, he's written children's books, he's got a great reputation of children's writer, all kind of things. But before that he wrote SF. And he wrote SF for about 15 years before he started to change tack. And in the mid 80s, he began to write mainstream novels and short stories. And as I say, travel. He traveled an awful lot. He was a signaler in the RAF, based in the South Pacific, all over the place, North Africa, the Middle East. And he travels a lot now, you know, he's a guy who's sort of been everywhere. And he really opens your head up. And this is one of his later mainstream things. This is a book called In the Hollow of the Deep Sea Wave, which as you see has a Hokusai um, picture on the cover. And this is published by Bodley Head. And this is a novella and some short stories. And I haven't read it for years. So I'm not gonna say too much about it because I need to go back to it, but it is really good. So if you see any of Gary's mainstream novels, pick them up. But the one that really did it for me was his first mainstream novel. And of his books, which I've read, and I've read pretty much all of his early stuff, his, his first sort of 20 books or so, I've read them all, was this one. And this is Witchwater Country, again, published by Bodley Head. And look at that jacket. Isn't that beautiful? This isn't too difficult to get. And what you can see, there's a young lad on the Fens, East Anglia. And I can best describe this as an East Anglian, Southeast England version of Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury, except it may even be better. And I know Gary would say, no, it's not. And yes, that did inspire me. It's just about um, a young boy and his friends growing up in this area. And you know, the wonder of these flat open spaces, which are quite marshy. And there's all these sort of rumours of witches and the local folklore. If you like folk horror, you'd like it. It's not a horror novel. It's not a fantasy novel. It's not an SF novel. It is a mainstream novel, but it's about the imagination of a child on the brink of adulthood, which is very, very much what Dandelion Wine is about. And as you see, it's very, very beautiful indeed. And this is probably, if you said to me, what is your favourite associational to SF novel? What is your favourite mainstream novel by an SF writer? And, you know, I could probably say Empire of the Sun, but this is actually my favourite. I think this is a wonderful, wonderful book. And Gary has a quiet power, understated. He is not somebody who thrusts himself forward and is flashy and showy, but he's a very, very fine craftsman. And in this, his art really comes out. And it's an absolutely fantastic book. It's, it really is a modern classic and should be a lot better known. But sadly, you know, it has been in print since it's paperback edition in the 80s so watch out for it it's fantastic if you like bradbury if you like tom remy if you like simak you know you'd love this it's if you like stephen king you'd enjoy it it's absolutely beautiful i go into raptures when i even think about it what a lovely book almost as good is another book by gary this is spiral winds and i'll pop that on the podium now spiral winds 
began out of a short story that Gary wrote for Interzone called Spiral Sands, which isn't really an SF or fantasy story either. And this is mostly set in the Middle East. And Spiral Winds, great title, I think you'll agree. It's bodily head again, absolutely beautiful. And this is about the lives of two men who, when they're boys, they are involved with an event which is of historical significance. Now, the other night I watched Lawrence of Arabia by David Lean. I watched the director's cut, which is enormously long, Pedro Tour. And of course, Lawrence of Arabia was a interesting, quite reclusive and strange English military figure who wanted to unite the Arabs to revolt against the Turks and the Ottoman Empire. And there were lots of geopolitical things going on in the background. He was being placed that way by the British Army, who he worked for. But he wanted them to achieve independence, and that didn't happen. But that's a whole other kettle of fish. And fundamentally, what happens in this is that both the boys in it are drawn to the Arabian Peninsula and interesting stuff goes on. But what it begins with, it begins with a famous incident involving T. Lawrence. Now, Lawrence, when he came back to Britain after becoming internationally famous as the would-be liberator of Arabia, he had a difficult time and he had quite an interesting time. He had various aliases. He would check with the government and he'd say, look, I'm being bothered by the press all the time. I need to go underground. And they'd give him a fake name, fake ID. And he would always be outed by the press. And then he joined the Air Corps when he was about 40 and he wrote a book about it called The Mint, which is amazing. And you read these great sequences of he gets up and he's 40 and he's coughing in the morning and all the other men are 20. They don't know he's this famous figure and he gets outdid again. And what he did, he sort of retired really to Dorset and he had a house down there. And it's not that far away from me and I'm going to go down and visit it at some point. I've been past it a few times. And one day he got on his motorcycle, drove down the country lane, and there were two boys bicycling. And to avoid them, the, he had to swerve. The motorbike crashed and he was killed. And that's what this book begins with. It begins with the two boys and it follows them. And of course, it's fictionalized. It's not about the real people at all. And they both end up in the Middle East and in that part of the world where Lawrence was, and it goes from there. I'm not going to tell you any more, but it's fantastic stuff. And it's very lyrical, and the colours of the desert are there, the heat, the dust, the the whirling dervishes of the dust devils. It's all there. And Gary's been there, he can conjure it up. You can feel how dry it is. So, you know, do watch out for these. These are fantastic novels. Really recommend them. Again, they've had scant sort of printings and things, but you really must get them. Great, great stuff. What a wonderful, underrated artist he is. So that's Gary Kilworth. We then move on to somebody who is massively famous and we could spend a long time talking about his mainstream novels but I just want to give him a quick mention and that's Michael Moorcock and this is Byzantium Indoors which is the first, this is the, this is the Seca first edition and this is the first of the four Between the Wars book about his character Colonel Piat who is, Piat is a pretty horrible character he lives in Ladbrook Grove. He knows the young Jerry Cornelius. He has a bit of a thing for Jerry's mother. So there's a connection to the science fiction novels and the Jerry Cornelius sequence, which are part of the Eternal Champion sequence. So this is part of it as well. Nearly everything Moorcock has written links into the Eternal Champion. And Piat is actually Jewish, though he claims not to be. He's originally from pre-Soviet Russia and this goes back to his beginnings and he lives through all the wars and he's a very old man by the time you get to the 80s and he lies all the time and he's a horrible right-wing fascist idiot and he's just vile but <laughs> what you get in this is Moorcock is really letting his liberal sort of impulses spill out you know in the bile at these people and he's a horrible horrible person and you know he just sort of embroiders stuff all the time and he's sort of like an anti-semitic Jew. It really is quite unpleasant and strange. And in terms of satire, they're absolutely fantastic. And in the final volume, he has this encounter with Hitler, which we won't really go into, which involves some very unpleasant sexual shenanigans and the most unpleasant kind you can imagine. So Between the Wars consists of Byzantium Endures, The Laughter of Carthage, Jerusalem Commands, 
and the vengeance of Rome. And you put them together and it's one sentence. Byzantium endures the laughter of Carthage. Jerusalem commands the vengeance of Rome. Sounds great, doesn't it? You like historical fiction, you can't go wrong with these. Great, great stuff. And Mike's very proud of them and rightly so because they are wonderful satirical historical novels and through the lens of history Morka comments a lot on the things we've seen politically in our lifetimes really sort of deathless stuff I think we're almost at the close now there could be a lot more I could do and maybe I'll do another one of these at some point because you know there is so much great stuff I just stopped looking I was going through my books and I thought well I'll stop now because I've got at least 10 or 20 and that'll make up the fake top 10 you've endured and I'm going to finish with a trilogy. Wow, a trilogy, you say? Good grief. A trilogy. And this is the wonderful Blue Ant trilogy by William Gibson. This is Pattern Recognition, the first of the Blue Ant books. Look at the shine on that. There we are. And this came out, let's see, around about 2000. Let's have a look. And look at that. It's got a um, postcard in there, promotional postcard in there. And Bill signed this for me. Good old Bill. Um, one of our sort of meetings. We've met five times. And let's have a look. When did this come out? 2003. And he works in trilogies. And I have to say, after New Romancer, the short story collection, Burning Chrome, Count Zero, those early cyberpunk books, these books, this trilogy, the Blue Ant trilogy, are my favourite books by Gibson. And I think they're astonishing. Um, this is the first one, Pattern Recognition. And what they're about, they're, they're kind of thematic. They're about a guy called Hubertus Bijond, who is the protagonist of the books. And yet he's in the background. And he's this sort of sleazy sort of businessman. Um, Hubertus Big End, or Bijond, is the sort of French pronunciation. And he employs people to be cool hunters. People are looking for the next trends because he's going to invest in the next trends and exploit them and make money out of them. And this is about a clip of film that's come up on the internet by somebody who everybody feels is destined to be the next Stanley Kubrick and a young woman called Casey, which references Case in New Romancer, is hired to track down this elusive internet Kubrick, Casey Pollard. And she has this strange ability where she can look at a logo or a bit of graphic design and know whether it's going to catch on or not. And it's almost like a psychic ability. She sort of gets a prickle in her skin or something. And there is one part at the beginning of the novel where one of the sort of major powerful characters connects with Casey through what seems to be like a VR thing. So there's a hint of SF in there, but that is dropped in the later volumes. And it's fascinating stuff. But this is an interesting example of a trilogy where they get better as the sequence goes on rather than you know start the top and downhill and i think really with you know with gibson i mean he starts in the with the first trilogy with neuromancer and as much as i like count zero i'm less keen on mona lisa overdrive it is like a downward curve he does different things in each one and that's very brave he could have just done the same thing and he had that facility but these he sort of goes further and the second volume they come out of big gaps and I read this when it came out and it blew me away but then I waited for the other two till both were out to read them and I with Gibson even though I love his work I wait till I'm in the mood for his prose I always do unlike people like Chris Priest M. John I buy them and I read them straight away with, with Bill Gibson I tend to wait and this is zero history and this is absolutely fantastic and this is about a the cool hunter in this is a former rock star who's fallen on hard times who is set out to find this type of denim and it's a type of denim called the gabriel hounds and there's something like you know six pairs of jeans made of the gabriel hounds denim in the world and it's not marked anywhere to recognize it is really really sort of difficult and hubertus bijand and his team they want to know what it is about the gabriel hounds that's going to make it the thing and as you can see i'm angling this to try and get rid of the shine because we've got a lovely sunny day but who cares it's the sort of glassine wrap on the cover and absolutely absolutely marvelous it's so good what you feel is that when you're reading these books and you know these are now like sort of 12 13 14 years old you feel that you are on the cutting edge they represent the super fast hyper real world that we live in the up to the minute the on trend the viral it's all there and 
they're sort of very loose and quite paranoid and strange but at the same time they're exhilarating and sharp and witty you know and you get the odd arch raised eyebrow and the dialogue is just really fantastic and the third one spook country which obviously spook is a spy and it's kind of engineered to look like a spy novel and funny enough mick heron's novels i'm a big big fan of mick heron and, and uh, mick and i are mates we we go back quite a few years it's uh, it's interesting because you know they the later editions of the mick heron books look like this in hardcover and spook country may even be the best of all you know and there is a wonderful wonderful thing i can't tell you too much about them where a certain thing is being tracked around the globe and what it's doing and that is in these books anyway it's all about cool hunting there's all sorts of wonderful subplots there's one of the books there's a magazine called node which is a bit like wired and you know it's all these sort of people on the hyper edge the people who make you feel like you're uncool and then you realize that maybe they're uncool as well because they're always trying too hard and maybe they get there for a while but everybody drops off the wagon in the end but these are fantastic so that's a little bit of associational sf that is sf that isn't sf at all it's mainstream fiction written by writers who are predominantly sf writers i hope i've inspired you to seek these books out and if you only read sf and don't read mainstream fiction these are people you'll be comfortable with and you know they often step outside their boxes to write these things they know they won't essentially be able to sell them. They'll get stuck in general fiction. They're away from their SF and fantasy and they could get lost. And, you know, and they're usually real sort of labors of love and they're big publishing financial risks for the writers, for the publishers. And, you know, readers often don't know they're there. So there's a few things to look for. And maybe I'll do another one of these at another time. And I hope you enjoy that because you mustn't read just SF all the time. You know, you won't have a full enjoyable reading life if you only read sf and your critical faculties be sharpened by taking on some general fiction and focusing on traditional things like character except these books even at the most traditional they have that magic that only sf writers have that way of looking at the world is special so this is outlaw bookseller signing out with the chaotic top 10 or 20 associational sf bye for now Thank you.